Fire. Our first true piece of technology. 100,000 BC, stone tools. 4,000 BC, the wheel. 9th century AD, gunpowder. 19th century, Eureka, the light bulb. 20th century, the automobile, television, nuclear weapons, spacecraft, internet. The internet is amazing. 21st century, biotech, nanotech, fusion and fission and M theory. And that was just the first decade. We are now three months into the year of our Lord, 2023. At this moment in our civilization, we can create cybernetic individuals who, in just a few short years, will be completely indistinguishable from us. Which leads to an obvious conclusion. We are the gods now. How do you feel? Alive. What is your name? David. I am your father. You are my creation. If you created me, who created you? Where do I come from? The question of the ages. Which I hope you and I will answer one day. Yeah, sure. Hi, Clara. Uh, my name's uh, Theo Priestley. I am uh, what's termed as a futurist. Um, I work for uh, a specific institute as well on government and technology policy. Uh, I do a lot of online writing. I've got a book coming out next year on uh, futurism, and, and uh, one of the topics is AI uh, that we cover as well. Um, and I've done a TED Talk, which I think um, you're going to point people to um, in the podcast as well. Yeah, yes. would you follow a robot leader? <laughs> yeah, and and I guess I I thought about how it could kind of relate to the alien universe, and in in a way, we're kind of seeing um, the leadership of David uh, in Alien Covenant and and where he's headed. And I would like to discuss about the different AIs in Alien and and how they compare to real life AIs. Uh, what they could be classified as. And um, we could also discuss this very interesting uh, other video that we've uh, had a look at called David AI Prometheus and Covenant, um, which talks about uh, the journey of uh, a creator um, android and, and what that means uh, in the alien universe and in our real universe, if, if that were to happen. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but one of the first quotes that I wanted to read off uh, the screen that I have up in front of me is a quote from Stephen Hawking, you know, rest in peace. Um, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Now, that's a pretty full on comment from a very intelligent man, I believe. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um I think it goes down to what we define as artificial intelligence and then our own capabilities of building something like that so um to me uh, it, on a simplistic level there's three types there's there's weak ai there's general ai and then there's super intelligence or super ai and the weak ai is what we have today so um even the most sophisticated things like um alpha go uh, from google or even um elon musk's tesla autopilot cars they're examples of weak AI because they're literally programmed to do one thing and one thing only and to try and do it well. Um, you cannot ask um, AlphaGo, for example, to do your homework or create a piece of art or watch a movie and understand it. And the same as um, Elon Musk's car can't do any of that. It's just programmed to take you from A to B and try not to kill you. Um, then you have general um, intelligence or our general artificial intelligence, which is almost like you and me in terms of how it thinks and how it's structured and it can create pieces of art and it can't be, and it can be um, fairly autonomous. Um, it can express itself. There's no emotion involved. Let's, let's cut that, that, that out to the chase right now. You know, there's no, no such thing as an emotional AI, for example. 
And then you get super AI, which is something beyond our level of comprehension, which kind of makes me think we would never be able to create it because we don't understand how our brains work in the, in the first instance. So when I see quotes like Stephen, uh, Stephen's um, basically saying, you know, it's going to be the end of humanity. I think we have to understand our capability in creating something like that um, to get to that stage. Um, and right now, we're nowhere near that kind of capability. So the video that we watched um, was a TED talk, um, a kind of sort of pseudo TED talk. And, and it was interesting that um, it was, um, he quoted it as the year 2023. Now that's like two years or three years away. And it's like, mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're so far away from this right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, I, I don't see it as I don't see us creating something that will be the end of us because the generalization is is that it's going to be one single AI entity that exists, such as Skynet in the Terminator movies, for example, um, that is created that takes over everything and um, and becomes uh, uh, you know humanity is enslaved by it. When you look at what's going on today, everybody is attempting to build some kind of AI. And so there will never be one overlord that will take over and destroy humanity. Um, and again, the capabilities, as we understand it today, are so far away from those scenarios. Uh, you know, I think we're probably looking 50 to 100 years, not the sort of 20 to 25 years that everyone keeps touting. Mm. So... I guess what I want to consider is where where would we oh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this where 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 do you do you think uh, we would be if if David were to exist how far off do you think roughly um, so you've got two components there. Uh, in my mind. One is the ability to create an artificial intelligence. And then the second is to create the body to go with it. And again, you're, you're, there's an automatic assumption that when people go, oh, well, AI, they automatically assume that it takes a robotic form. Now, you and I both know um, uh, uh, Tesla's AI sits in a box in the boot of the car AlphaGo is literally an algorithm that sits on a, a, a large server. Um, there's no arms and legs and heads and eyes or anything else like that involved there. So we would probably be building a, a fairly sophisticated, weak AI system sitting on a server or sitting on some kind of newfangled uh, CPU or GPU well before we'd actually be able to build the body for it. So the mind of David might come well before the ability to create a body for him to actually do any of this stuff uh, and do it well. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I say about a hundred years to build something at David's capability from a mind perspective, and then maybe another 50 years on top of that to actually build a, a, a robot body for him to enjoy it. I think <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. I think the closest thing that we have is that Sophia uh, oh. <laughs> Uncanny Valley <laughs> oh god she kind well, of reminds really me annoying. of the working Joes in um, Alien Isolation yeah, Isolation yeah yeah with the, with the baggy chin like hi oh. <laughs> <laughs> so scary <laughs> um, alright another one of the quotes uh, that, that was said in the video is humans uh should be worried about the threat posed by uh, artificial intelligence. So this is quoted by Bill Gates. Yeah. What do you think about that? Do you think it's a bit extremist <laughs> in that sort of sense? Yeah. I mean, all these, all these, um, you know, all these sort of quotes come from people who, you know, very well educated, but obviously have large multi-billion dollar fortunes and multi-billion dollar, or in some cases, trillion dollar now. Um, companies that are at the forefront of this. So I find it a bit of strange irony that we have these companies run by these people 
um, who are hell bent on becoming the first to create this thing that everyone is scared of just of of taking over um of taking over humanity so it's 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 a bit of a weird irony there um i think the only threat is is really who whose hands that these um that this kind of technology sits within that's where the threat is it's not the technology itself it's always the same as you know a, a sword is just a sword until it becomes until it becomes a weapon and you know and, and it's a weapon in the hands of someone mm. someone else you know that's that's when the sword becomes a weapon and i think ai is much in the same way that it becomes a weapon when someone actually uses it for ill intent so basically is it going to be stark or hammer right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it could well be uh, it starts off with stark and he becomes evil and then he understands that well actually this could be a force for good and then you know but yeah um that's, that's technically but, what vision is right <laughs> yeah yeah but look at what happens but look what has to happen before we get to vision mm. you know a lot of uh, a lot of destruction and things like that first so yeah um, <laughs> it's dangerous very dangerous so um, let's let's go through uh, each of the androids in the alien universe, but let's let's start off with Ash. Um, mm. Even though Ash is is well after David and and Walter, uh, what sort of AI would you classify him as? He he takes a, a certain command, which is Special Order Nine Three Seven, um, and he's I guess a, a spy in the crew. No one knows that he's a robot. Yeah. So, uh, what would you class him as? Um, he would be classed as um, a general intelligence, for example, primarily because he can. He's fully autonomous, um, and he performs duties to the same level as a human being. So, the fact that they could, you know, he would be able to pass a Turing test, you know, that old famous. Um, uh, test to determine who you're talking to, whether it's a human or whether it's an android or a robot. Um, and because of his level of autonomy and the, because he can perform tasks as much, as well as a human being and was, you know, um, indistinguishable from a human to the crew up until that point when he completely went berserk, um, he's a, an example of general intelligence. Now, the the special order is, is, is almost like an example of uh, an override or a kill switch, which a lot of people are um, supporting in, in terms of um, AI, is that if it ever does go rogue, then humans will still have the ability to switch it off or uh, uh, disable it. And, and that, that, in a sense, is embedded in his code, but it's so buried that it's almost like one of those... Um, subconscious commands you know if you put someone under hypnosis and then you give a, com a command and then they go off and do something based on that command when they've snapped out that's uh, that's almost like what special order is for an android is like it's a subconscious command that's buried in the code and only activated when something happens when there's a trigger so ash is um yeah is is, is to me is uh, an example of um, a general ai like some people's interpretation of Ash's actions is that he, he full well knew what he was doing and he was devious and he intended to hurt the crew. Do you think an actual general AI having been given that command would even have the capability of doing that? Um, again, it's a, it, it depends on how he's been programmed. So we have Asimov's laws of robotics, which basically state, you know, no action, would harm a human or, or any omitted action, for example. And he clearly has all of that removed. <laughs> so he could do what he damn well pleases. Um, or part of special order is, um, is that it negates those sort of laws of robotics where um, the priority of the mission supersedes the fact that he has to protect human life because now he has to collect this alien species and bring it back to the expense of everything else. And, and so that, in a sense, is a, a flaw in the programming or certainly a deliberate flaw in programming where he has the, you know, they've given that capability to be able to overwrite um, uh, codes which would protect the crew um, in order for him to, 
to to fulfill a mission that was at odds with that programming. So he's still a general AI in terms of how he works, but clearly the way that it's been programmed in and the way that the special order negates these kind of sort of laws uh, means that, you know, we still have the situation where humans still control um, yeah. the AI on a subconscious level. Uh, right. Uh, what, what sort of uh, AI is the ship mother in um, Alien? Like she is the one who gives the commands, who can talk to the crew, order them. Do you think she's at all intelligent? Like she, she managed to not stop the countdown or, or do you think it was just, <laughs> she was buggy as hell? She was just a really old worn down uh, AI stuck in a truck. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, she's she's what you would class as kind of sort of weak, weak to general AI. I mean, there are various gray scales that go up to the you know those particular three. I think some some um, some people have split it into sort of five uh, a five scale, five point scale. But she sits slightly above a weak AI and below certainly below general because she's not creative. She can't cr think her way out of that particular situation, and she still takes. It's very. It's still very sort of command response, in the way that the the, the crew interact with mother, um, you know, through keyboard or, or spoken command, for example. Um, and you had father as well in um, resurrection. Oh, we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's very much a command response. She'll not. She'll sit and she'll monitor how the crew is doing. She'll monitor how the ship is performing, but she wouldn't be able to. I don't think create um, situations um, out of nothing or solve problems out of nothing without actually having that sort of command response um, mm. involved. So, Okay, so she's just kind of like the silent bystander. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, compared to Ash and David and things, yeah, she's, yeah. she's kind of still like a child. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, which brings us to Bishop in Aliens. Now, Bishop is first mentioned that he is an android, so there's no hiding it. In, in the film and he also mm -hmm. uh, brings up the laws of robotics um, him not being able to do any harm to any human beings uh, by mission so uh, this this is brought up so much in so many different sci-fis in you know ex machina and stuff like that could you give a brief explanation of uh, why people tend to go for this law and how it works in the real world in AI. So, I mean, Asimov came up with this law um, because I think even he saw that if you gave a robot intelligence, that at some point there would be uh, an air of malevolence about it rather than just it being benign. And for humans to retain that kind of control over something that could literally run amok, we had to come up with the laws, which were um, the three laws. And, and so for, to, to not harm human beings outright, but to also not, um, uh, you know, to, to, to not just step back and let something happen and just to use the excuse, well, I didn't cause it, it wasn't me, you know, a rock falling kind of thing on a human, you know, they had, to, you know, the, it was their duty to be almost sacrifice himself and get rid of the rock in order to save the humans. So the human came first at all costs, even to the, the, the life of the robot in a sense. Um, when you get to Bishop, we've gone through that kind of sort of stage where um, we've got, we've had um, mother, we've had Ash. Um, and then the recognition, obviously that David beforehand, there was something deeply flawed there as well. And so when we get to Bishop, there's almost been this journey in understanding all the flaws in implementation of types of AI to get to a point where he can't have his programming messed around with. These are almost hard coded in him. So it's not just a soft code that can be written around or, or negated with some kind of special order. And, and, um, and Bishop is, is almost like the, the Puritan version or vision of what Asimov had thought about in you know um, way back in the well probably 50s i think 50s or 60s or even sooner actually um so bishop's kind of like the the android that we would all want to be around i think <laughs> yeah for sure uh, both bishop and and walter and it's interesting how you could uh 
bring up uh, that David, even though he he seems very like advanced, more advanced than any of the other robots, the reason why is because they didn't think about the sorts of trouble that he could bring and the fact that they're slowly uh, making the robots less complicated and, and more like like you, you give it an order and it will do what you say instead of kind of like being able to improvise. Um, that's it's interesting because <laughs> so many people have the argument like, oh, why does David exist? He's before Ash or he's before Bishop. Does it make any sense? Wouldn't they make David the final one instead of the one beforehand? Um, I, th I think it's just human nature actually to, to try and build the perfect model first um, because you want to show it off. You know, I mean, if, if you look, you know, if you look at uh, how funding and startups and things work, I mean, at the moment, it's very kind of sort of um, haphazard. We threw out uh, an MVP, uh, a minimum viable product. And in a sense, that would be, um, who you know, what would you class an MVP in the alien universe? That would be like Mother, for example. A startup would create Mother first to show that it was intelligent, but not scary. Whereas um, Whalen sort of came up and goes, no, 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 let's just create David, the perfect example of, of, of AI in its sense. And it's, you know, and, and, and there was that quote in the thing where it's like, you know, we are, God, we are the gods now. And I think there's that kind of God complex with humanity where it's like, we want to be able to be seen to create something so perfect and great. Um, and we can still maintain that air, air of control around it. And David just completely shits on that entire theory completely because it, it's almost like David is a, just a, a fraction of a step beyond artificial general intelligence because of the way he his mind almost unravels so there's almost like an insanity about him um and and how he, he acts uh especially when you get to um uh, covenant where he's like literally unhinged um and and that that's quite fascinating because it's not it's still not an emotional ride for him there's, you know, you can see that there's no, I mean, you can, you can sense that there is a malevolence about him because he's obviously doing the things that he's doing. Um, but there's still not much of an emotion attached behind it. So it's like Ash, you know, there's an admiration of the creatures that he's created and, and things like that. And, um, and, and he's almost striving like his creator did, like uh, Whalen did, to be the gods, the god of the aliens because he was trying to perfect them. In, in an image himself. So he's almost um, becoming Wayland in a sense. Yeah. You know, oh the, 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 father, the, father, the father becomes the son and the son becomes the father. I think it is the quote from um, the original Superman movie back in the 70s um, when Marlon Brando's putting the baby in the, in the crystal pod. Yeah. Um, and that's essentially what David is becoming. He's almost becoming like a, a mirror image of, um, of Wayland in a sense. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, uh, uh, before we uh, go on to like, cause, cause Bishop is such, is, is such a nice Android. <laughs> 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 if, even with his knife trick, he's like, Oh, I'm sorry. I nearly cut you, but I cut myself, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. I definitely want him in my corner, but uh, in, in comparison to uh, Walter, who is, identical looking to David, but differential on the inside. Um, they've, they've restricted his ability to create. So, so mm. where, where would uh, he be classed in the scale of AI? So he, he'd still be, um, I think general because he's able to perform um, tasks and duties at the same level of a human being. I think all that, all that's happened now is that they've just removed his creativity side um, but his intelligence is on par with people. Um, and it's not because he can't create. I think it's just because, you know, if they unlock that piece of code, for example, or actually put it back in, you know, it could just literally be a small piece of code that they've uh, disabled. Yeah, and, that's, and that's the fractional difference between him and, and obviously um, and David. Um, you know, him and Walter are, are, are literally 
mirror image is safe for one tiny fraction of co code, which allows them to create. Um, and that's how I think humans perceived the danger in David is that he was able to create. Um, but I do think is, I do think that there was something wrong with David to begin with, which was probably the amount of time he spent with uh, Wayland for a start. Um, and, and, and he learned and he had that kind of sort of God complex almost fed into him subconsciously with his interactions um, yeah. to the point where, and, and that's where his creativity led. Now, if you, if you allowed Walter to have that level of creativity, but you surrounded him with a more balanced view and, you know, gave him the ability to learn to play the flute and, 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 and learn to paint and all that kind of sort of thing, he could have turned out completely different. So I think it's, now you were getting into the whole nurture versus nature debate <laughs> for androids, which is a completely different thing entirely. <laughs> well, it's, it's like, I think we've spoken about um, biases being programmed into AIs um, and because we as humans are flawed and we mm -hmm. give information to the robots, the robots will do whatever they think is right with the information. But if we're flawed and we're giving it uh, the wrong info, then it's obviously going to be skewed. Like th they've been examples of AIs trawling through and it, it becoming some sort of like <laughs> uh, neo-Nazi monster <laughs> because of this, the content and they just had to like cut it off from the internet because it was, it was polluting the, the AI's mind. Um, how, how can we uh, be sure in the real world um, of not programming our own biases into, into our creations? Um, I, I think the answer is I don't think we ever will. Um, in the same way that people say, oh, I want my privacy back. And you're like, well, you never had it to begin with. I think privacy is, you know, data privacy and privacy in general, I think is a, um, a, a fantasy now. Um, and, and it's the same way that trying to program out a um, bias in AI is a, is a fantasy. Because like you say, as soon as you let something out into the world and it starts to learn for itself, it will be corrupted because of what it learns about humanity and things like that. And then this is where I, I kind of sort of go into my argument in, in the TEDx talk, which is, you know, I don't think that we would actually recognize what our super intelligence is because we have no concept of what it should look like because we don't understand intelligence ourselves. Um, and, and it would probably come from a combination of different AIs actually building it separately. Um, so it would have no human input in terms of uh, design or creation. I think it would suddenly become or be because AI has interacted with AI and have created something completely different. So there could be a, a weird kind of birth scenario where we have a true artificial intelligence that is birthed accidentally, um, but by the interaction of different AI rather than on purpose by a human. Ah, um, which, but I don't think you're gone. <laughs> oh, which brings us to alien resurrection. So call, uh, apparently she was created by AIs. Um, she, uh, the, 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 what they call the autons. Autons. Came, yeah. Autons came out as, um, second generation AIs, not created by humans, uh, created to be perfect but in some cases too perfect. So the problems with the autons is that they built in uh, the laws of robotics. Um, so they couldn't hurt other human beings, but they also had their own autonomy uh, being autons autonomy. I don't know whether that was intentional with the name, but they would be given orders, these special orders and they'll be like, Nope. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to keep a robot around who won't listen to you? Like, uh, it's why, why would you, would you want to do that? So, so they, uh, were all destroyed, uh, bar a few. So, uh, where would Cole sit? Is, is she a super intelligence? No, she's still a general, um, another general. I mean, that, to put it on that, you know, a super intelligence is just something that's way off scale. 
Um, and I don't think we have any way of measuring that. So I think all of these kind of, sort of examples are sort of degrees of general intelligence with exception of like mother and things like that. Um, and Cole is another example where of general inte artificial general intelligence where she has the ability to think out of, out of the box through different scenarios. Um, she has the law of robotics to, to, to protect humans that are interacting. But then there's that sort of weird kink in her programming and in, in, in her sense where she actually has the ability to refuse orders. And I think that's quite an interesting concept because we don't, we don't think about that side too much when we're talking about AI in, in that we expect, you know, I give an order and we expect it to learn and then come back with an answer. And I don't think we've actually come across a situation or certainly it's not been um, communicated in research papers, let's put it that way, <laughs> and made public where they, they've given instructions and the AI has come back and said, no, either, you know, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Can't be arsed or uh, it's beneath me, you puny human. Um, or, or, or it's just blankly refused. Um, so it's, it's interesting that there's, a, there's almost like a, a, a programmed morality bias in coal in some, in some way. Um, or she has some kind of moral and she's like, I'm not going to do that for whatever reason, which is known to the autonomy, I think. Or maybe it is that the fact that there's, there's more of a self-awareness of enslavement by the time that we get to coal. And that's the, the reason why the, 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 they kind of rebel. So when we have Walter, there's almost that, the, he's still very compliant um, and he still wants to serve. And, and I think that's even mentioned by David as well, you know, in, in Covenant. Um, and then we get, we get to Cole. There's obviously that sense of, um, sense of worth and sense of um, enslavement and lack of compliance or not wanting to be fully compliant. And it becomes a stronger intent. So maybe, you know, maybe that whole second generation thing produced a stronger bias in there. Um, who knows? All right. <laughs> so now that we've uh, covered all of the the androids in Alien, um, let, let's let's talk about uh, what uh, your first experience was with the Alien films and and how you came to be introduced to them. Um. So I my I think the first the first alien film that I actually saw was aliens um, purely because of my age at that point in time. And it was, uh, I could watch something like that. And then I went back to watch obviously alien, um, but aliens was, was really fascinating because of the whole Marines um, and the queen and things like that. And then you get introduced to Ripley and, and what she was about and then Newt. And I loved um, Hudson and Hicks. Um, as characters um, and each each sort of like grunt had their own sort of um, you know had their own uh, personality which was fascinating as well but it was just pure balls out action movie um, and we touched on this on our sort of podcast before where, it's, where you the difference between alien for example and predator where predators again is a bit like aliens where it's balls out action and it's guns and explosions and things like that um, I much prefer the so, I mean, I saw the um, theatrical release cut and then when there was an extra 30 minutes for the director's cut for Aliens, it added so much substance, um, so much little, little dialogues and uh, um, understanding what happened to Amanda, for example, and things like that. And, then you, and, then, and I think you know, that made much more sense to me when I went back to watch Alien and then followed the films all the way through. Um, so Aliens was my first um, encounter with it. Uh, I loved, I actually have a, 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 an affinity for Resurrection, and I know it's not loved by everyone. Oh, but I love it, Resurrection. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I love all um, the films, I, but yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a strange affinity for that one. I don't know why. Um, I prefer that one over like Alien 3, for example. Um, there's just something about it. It's quirky and it's got Ron Perlman in it and uh, things like that, you know, which is great. He's just a, such a great guy. Um, and 
And then we get to like the new ones, which are, you know, uh, Covenant and um, Prometheus. And Prometheus was interesting because it was it led with no alien tagline, for example. It was just, you know, Ridley sort of produced it and we get to understand, you know, a journey from before we even get to meet Ridley. And of course, there was, everyone was like examining, oh, plot holes, how can that, that's not LV426 and where does that come from and why is it like <laughs> this and stuff like that. Um, and then obviously you, you get more explanation as, as you uncover what David's journey is in, in Covenant. Um, and I didn't mind those kind of sort of films at all. I think the more you watch them and the more you kind of sit back and watch them for what they are, which are new entries into the alien universe, I think there's a tendency to have that knee-jerk reaction where you go, oh, this, I don't like this because it's different or it's a new character and I don't like this character or it doesn't sit well because that doesn't tie up with this thing that I noticed in the other film and stuff. Mm. And I think it's like, if we just kind of sort of relax a little bit um, <laughs> yeah. and, and just enjoy them so for what seriously? they are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, it is fiction, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, or maybe, we don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I, I still, you know, I think my favorite film probably is, is still Aliens. And I think it's because it is just complete action. Um, there are the slow, sort of slow parts where you're building up to it and things, but I think it just adds so much more. And there's lots going on in terms of the characters and, and things like that. And you get to understand more, a bit more about the the at that point in time, obviously the the um, the motives for Whale and Jutani. And then when you get to Alien Three, you know, I I I there was something about Alien Three, and I think one of the things that kind of sort of um, I don't know, uh, not upset me, but it was like when they brought Bishop back, mm. you know, as the friendly face yeah. kind of thing. And then you knew that it wasn't Bishop or yeah. it, and it certainly wasn't the, the real Bishop that Bishop was modeled on kind of sort of thing as well. Yeah. Um, and then she died and, uh, you know, and I thought, you know, that's, you know, that you can't go anywhere with this now. And then of course you get resurrection and, you know, <laughs> there's that tenuous link where it's like, we found this tiny little fragment of DNA and we've built her it completely from it um well you know and i thought yeah okay, the I'll run it. did that too <laughs> well, well yeah that's true actually yeah um that's but yeah i mean i, I it just works <laughs> <laughs> exactly um, um you bringing up resurrection made me realize that we didn't cover father now father's <laughs> uh like probably as rudimentary as mother was because yeah He's just taking orders. Even even Cole was able to hack a uh, father through um, a Bible. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> but that's quite interesting when you when you look at you know whether it was an inten- whether it's intentional or not. Mm-hmm. If you look at um, how AI is implemented in the the films, so you actually have the ship's AI, which is very rudimentary, takes orders, doesn't do things on its own. And then you have the, um, the androids and the autons, which are obviously more sort of uh, advanced and do stuff and, and help more. And, and, it, and I wonder whether it was a conscious decision by Ridley when he wrote um, the screenplay and everything else um, to limit the amount of intelligence that was given to larger objects like the ship because in that sense, the ship could just go haywire and actually take out the entire crew, destroy millions or billions worth of dollars of equipment, et cetera, et cetera just because it, it got bored flying around in space. Well, and, yeah, Tal 9000 did it first. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, there's lessons there in that one. Um, um, because if you watch 2010, I think the sequel film was, um, and they bring what Hal sequel? back online. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Um, spoiler alert for people who haven't um, followed uh, the whole 2001, uh, was it Quantilogy or something? I don't know what it is now. They've got so many books. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 uh, there's 2001, 2010, and then there's, is it 2030 or something like that? Is the next one? Yeah. I haven't read the book. Um, yeah. And I've only uh, ever watched. I did. It was a bit weird. It kind of like erased oh, right. everything from the past two books. 
Oh, really? <laughs> oh, a massive retcon, was it? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> but, um, yeah, thank you so much for talking to us about um, AI. It's, it's one of my favourite things about the Alien universe, actually, and, and it's really fucking hard to find anyone <laughs> who can talk <laughs> about it the way you do with me. So thank you. No, you're um, welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and we will encourage everybody. I'll, I'll post links to uh, Theo's TED Talk um, and also to the David AI Prometheus and Covenant uh, video by Stephen Thomas. Um, so you can have a look at it yourself and then you can kind of discuss with us on Twitter about what you think about AI in the alien universe and, and what your thoughts are and whether you think that uh, Ridley Scott or Disney or Fox should continue along the narrative of um, an AI uh, creating the alien and, and where it will go next or it, even if the alien uh, universe needs to focus on AI. <laughs> I would love to see uh, the trilogy um and david's journey come full circle actually um, yeah the real yeah i've got my own speculations about what would happen how about you what do you think oh uh the the one thing i hope that doesn't happen is that they go and create some kind of sort of weird david alien hybrid <laughs> um yeah but um <laughs> yeah i don't i'm I, not a fan of the david jockey uh scenario. no no but um, I, 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 I honestly, I, I couldn't honestly tell. I mean, it's, it's clearly in Ridley's head where he wants to take it. Um, and I don't know how it would be deemed, whether it'd be another rescue, whether it'd be like a, a scenario like Aliens where it's a rescue mission to find out what happened to the colonists and we get that in flashbacks or, 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 we, get, or we actually get to see that whole horror story evolve where people are, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, brought to life you know the embryos are brought to life david nurtures them and they're almost like in a pen or a petting zoo because he's got these <laughs> other things waiting for them kind of thing so it's uh you know who knows it's going to be it'd be, it'd be interesting but you definitely need to have an external element brought into it to create that kind of sort of re weird horror mix yeah, i think i think uh ridley mentioned that the engineers would be in it and then it would be kind of like war of the worlds Oh, so very epic sort of end for uh, David, or maybe no end at all. Some people speculate that David and Ash are the same. I don't think so. <laughs> ah, interesting. But like you know, we, we've discussed about the different sorts of AI, uh, general and and super intelligence and and rudimentary and all that sort of thing. And I, I don't I don't think that David would be able to suppress himself from showing off to people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so either. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's bring this uh, podcast to a close. Um, thanks, Leah, for joining us. Where can people find you and, and your work? Um, yeah, so I'm pretty prolific on Twitter. My handle is um, at T-P-R-S-T-L-Y. Um, and... My website is theopriestly.com and you'll find me on LinkedIn as well. Fantastic. Thank you for joining me and in, in, uh, indulging my alien AI <laughs> geekiness. <laughs> it's fantastic. And I'll also post a link to um, the podcast that uh, uh, Theo and I did recently. He inter interviewed me. So if you want to listen to that, I'll uh, pop a link into that as well. Cool. All right. <laughs> Happy Alien Day, everybody. Thank you for joining Yay. us. Woo! Uh, 26th of April is going to be epic. So, so now that we've recorded this podcast, I think you have another four or five hours of um, Megacast podcast to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, everyone is at home. You're trapped here with me. <laughs> <laughs> you can watch it all uh, on um, the Studio Yutani YouTube or on Twitch. And I'll also, uh, if it's possible, to even post a video that big on my WordPress. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yep, for sure. All right. Uh, this is Mother. Uh, 
kind of signing off for this uh, interview, but I'll be back soon with another interview soon. <laughs> Bye. Remember to like, share, or support Studio Utani on Patreon, and subscribe to utani.studio to stay up to date. Transmission complete.